Good morning, Church of Misty parishioners. Peace be with you. <laughs> In protest of the shitty ass coffee served at most churches in styrofoam cups, I have a delicious Nespresso here with me. In today's sermon, we are breaking down the FX documentary, The Secrets of Hillsong, also on Hulu. You could probably hear a dog in the background. I'm actually house sitting and dog sitting, so this is not my typical setup, but I just couldn't wait any longer to talk about this. Please keep in mind, I'm not calling out Christianity only specifically because anytime you get a group of people together, there is the risk and I almost wanna say the inevitability of shitty shit going down because humans are involved. Even churches will admit that. But Hillsong is just such an interesting example of this and how they failed their parishioners, failed their staffers, and failed the world in a sense. I have my notes down here if you see my gaze sort of drifting. Speaking of gays, happy Pride Month! Yeah, so I just wanted to summarize this documentary for you in case you haven't watched it or in case you weren't aware of how Hillsong was so prevalent in Christianity at this time because during the heyday of Hillsong, I was heavily involved in the Christian realm. So I felt like that was an interesting perspective to bring into the mix. Episode one goes over why Hillsong was even in the headlines in the first place, in the mainstream. I did want to mention the journalists who were featured in this documentary, Dan Adler and Alex French from Vanity Fair, Howie Kahn and Mike Cosper and Caitlin Beatty. So if you're not aware, Hillsong is a Pentecostal megachurch that started in Australia. Megachurches are defined as churches larger than 2,000 people. So why was Hillsong in the mainstream in the first place? I would say two primary reasons. One would be their music and two would be Justin Bieber. If you were in the church at the time of, like I said, Hillsong's heyday, which was like mid 2010, 2015, then you know Hillsong music. Spirit lead me where my faith is without borders. Let me walk upon, take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. <clears throat> you just have to take advantage of not being in an apartment sometimes. So their music was good. I mean, it was really good. Their musicians were hella talented. The songwriting was amazing. And they actually won Grammys. The documentary said that their music crossed over into secular music. I don't remember that being the case, but at the time I was an involved Christian, a devout Christian, I guess you could say. So I was like very familiar with this music already. So I'm not, I can't really speak to how well known it was in the secular realm. The other reason Hillsong became mainstream knowledge was Carl Lentz. Carl Lentz was the pastor and the person who planted the Hillsong New York City Church. Brian Houston, whose name will come up a lot, is the founder of Hillsong in Australia, like I said. He's really the big boss of this situation. So Carl Lentz was handpicked by Brian to plant this New York City branch of Hillsong in 2010. Carl was interviewed for this documentary, which was actually really cool to see, and I'll explain that. I just noticed Carl and I have the same hair, glasses, and gold necklace look going on, so I hey, hate twin. He was probably the main focus of this documentary, at least for the first two episodes for sure, because his scandal, which we'll talk about, his scandal is yet another reason why Hillsong continued to remain mainstream knowledge and in headlines. So Carl and his wife, Laura Lentz, started Hillsong NYC. Carl is from Virginia, I think, and his wife, Laura, is from Australia. Laura Lentz grew up with the Houstons. So remember, Brian Houston, the founder of Hillsong. So Laura Lentz was like child or like family friends growing up with the Houstons. They were super tight. Carl and Laura met because Carl went to Hillsong College in Australia. That's right. Hillsong has a college. I feel like that's honestly generous to call it a college. Carl 
went to this college. He became besties with Brian Houston's son. So he was in their family circle and that's how he met Laura. They're the same age. They got married when they were 25. Carl was looked at as like a prodigy of Brian Houston's because he just had a gift for speaking. He really connected with scripture and a lot of people described him as magnetic and attractive and he wore like cool clothes. And I mentioned Justin Bieber. So Carl, after he started Hillsong NYC, he, the church like really boomed. So celebrities became aware of this and Carl started to be in these circles where he was acting as almost a spiritual advisor for these people. And that's how Justin Bieber kind of came into his orbit. And Justin actually lived with the lenses for a short time. Hillsong NYC really blew up. And this is also a reason why Hillsong in general was so attractive to so many Christians was because it was literally like a concert. So I've been to a few of these churches where it's, it's a whole production. It's like light show, you know, the music is top notch, like you have amazing musicians, like I mentioned. There is a term called collective effervescence, which was coined by the father of sociology, whose name is Emil Durkheim. According to Durkheim, collective effervescence is a community or society may at times come together and simultaneously communicate the same thought and participate in the same action. If you've seen footage of church or you've been to a church, you see people, especially in more like modern style churches, you see people listening to music like, Jesus, yes, ooh, big stretch. <coughs> that's literally the same feeling that's cultivated at normal concerts where everybody's like dancing to the same song or you feel that like surge of emotion because everybody's just so together and you're participating in the same thing. And it's just like, it feels very human. Humans, we didn't used to have a lot of situations where we were together in that way, like in large groups. You know, this is, I'm talking like way back in the day. Nowadays we have concerts, we have festivals, we have secular things that people can participate in. So that is one of the reasons that church is not as popular <laughs> and why church attendance is like constantly decreasing because those really good feelings that people used to only get from going to a church, you can get that in so many other places. That being said, like I mentioned earlier, if you have a group of people together, issues are going to arise inevitably. So firstly, Hillsong was assumed to be a progressive church because again, this is Hillsong NYC. Like this is New York City there. It's extremely diverse. It's, you have the main pastor, Carl Lentz, wearing designer clothes, looking like fresh every single week, every single day, pictured in magazines with Justin Bieber and on fucking Oprah and Good Morning America and all of these mainstream TV shows. So people just without really digging into it would kind of assume that like, oh, it's a progressive church. But like I mentioned, it is Pentecostal, which Pentecostal is literally those churches with like snakes and speaking in tongues and stuff. In the church that I grew up in, it was an Episcopal church. We did not do any of that. Episcopalianism is really just like a very chill version of Catholicism. I feel like that's the easiest way to describe it. My senior year of high school, my mom met my now stepdad. And so I started going to his church with them, which is a non-denominational church. So not affiliated with like Catholicism, Episcopalian, Methodist. It's like also referred to as a Bible church by some people because their whole thing is like scripture and what does the Bible say? Like very legalistic, very fundamental in a sense, but they make it about your relationship with God. I really vibed with this non-denominational church because I was like, oh my God, this is like so much more of like a real experience with God. And I've always been a spiritual person. So I started going to this Christian college in 2013, which like I said, that was kind of as Hillsong was really rising up. So we sang a lot of Hillsong music in chapel and in church and I loved it. I didn't really know much about Hillsong. Before I moved, I had been really considering breaking up with Christianity, breaking up with the church. The Christian faith felt like a lie to me and I felt like I was lying to myself 
and I couldn't justify it anymore. And so I was like, you know what, when I move, I'm just going to not go to church anymore and just see how I feel. And here I am, like seven years later, living in sin and loving every minute of it. But back to my outline, again, I thought that it was a little bit more on the progressive side, but that is not the case. They're actually very conservative. And by conservative, I mean like anti-gay. One of the worship leaders who was interviewed in this documentary, he is gay and he and his partner went on Survivor. He was actually a staffer of Hillsong as a choir director and he asked Carl Lentz, he's like, hey, can I talk about Hillsong on Survivor? And Carl's like, yeah, be yourself. You know, that was his whole thing. He's like, I want you to be yourself, be yourself. So of course he talked about it. And then afterwards, Hillsong fired him and they released a statement saying that they like don't agree with homosexuality. So that was becoming more of a known fact. And then when Carl was asked directly in interviews, like how does Hillsong feel about gay people? And they kind of had to give vague answers and this is something I experienced in my time in the church where it's okay to be gay because God made you that way but you're not supposed to partake in gay activities. It's the same thing as like if you are a if you're a hetero couple it's okay to want to have sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend but if you do then that's a sin you know before you're married but it's that whole love the sin, hate the sinner, or wait, <laughs> hate the sin, love the sinner bullshit. That's like very counterintuitive, but that's literally, literally the stance that Hillsong took publicly. And that's still a really common thing to say in the church. Secondly, Hillsong was not paying their people. So as a church, they are tax deductible and they had tens of millions of dollars flowing in because they had the college, they had tithes, they had cafes in their churches. So all of that money is flowing through untaxed, yet day-to-day -day services were run by volunteers. So they're really just like taking advantage of these people who wanted to serve. And Hillsong even released this fucking membership tiers, like Patreon, <laughs> a kingdom builder is if you commit to $5,000 a year or more and you get to have coffee with Brian Houston. I was like, that's so disgusting. And so the documentary even said by 2015, there were 30 Hillsong locations around the world generating $100 million annually, largely untaxed. That's a direct quote. Thirdly, they were not giving people of color opportunities. Like I mentioned, Hillsong NYC was extremely diverse because New York City is very diverse. Carl Lentz was very vocal about Black Lives Matter, which is great. He would literally come out and say the phrase, Black Lives Matter. However, that was not reflected in church leadership at all. The documentary interviewed a lot of parishioners of color who expressed their heartbreak about this situation because here they feel like they have this deep relationship with Carl, which is great to feel very connected to your church leader, your pastor in an appropriate sense, but they didn't feel like he was really hearing their pain or taking that into consideration or like the church in general. Then there was the affair. If you hadn't heard of Hillsong before this, then you probably did after this story because it was everywhere like i was i was eating it up because the headlines were popping like it was are you serious like i felt like you couldn't get away from it but also that's you know the algorithm was like this bitch loves this shit so carl Lentz had an affair with this woman renin kareem and she like i said she gave a ton of interviews about this carl needed to be held accountable because here's this guy who's preaching righteousness to his congregation yet he is having an affair so he was then very publicly fired by Hillsong. This was in 2020 when this happened. However, as it turns out, Carl was actually a scapegoat for a lot of things, which we'll get into. This is a trigger warning about SA, and I'll be talking about that again later in this video, like quite a bit. So if that's a really sensitive topic for you, then please just proceed with caution. It's okay if you need to click off the video. Um, I would not investigate Hillsong any further. If that's not going to be healthy for you, you have to take your mental health into consideration first and foremost. So please be safe. A junior staffer claimed that Reed Bogard, who was a senior staffer at Hillsong, had essayed her. 
Then, without anything mentioned about his assault, he and his family moved to Dallas to plant Hillsong Dallas. But then he resigned a few months later because of the accusation. When Reed Bogard resigned, Brian Houston made a video basically saying like, thank you so much for your service and we love this family and da 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 da. No mention of these allegations. It was honestly disgusting. Similar to Carl, Reed had been handpicked by Brian to open Hillsong Dallas and to be a staffer at Hillsong NYC. That's kind of where we leave off on episode one. Let's go into episode two. Episode two really digs into Carl's story. So like I said, he went to Hillsong College. Again, college is too generous of a term because these classes were taught by unqualified people. They were taught by pastors, you know, people who weren't necessarily certified to educate other people on these topics. So it wasn't a very sophisticated education. Like I said, Carl and Laura Lentz got married in 2003 when they were both 25. She is super likable, chill Australian beach girl, and she seems like a very genuine person. I feel like both her and Carl, you never know like how somebody is in person. So take it with a grain of salt. I thought that lamp was like a person. That was kind of scary. <laughs> you can never really judge somebody from what you see as far as how they're portrayed in a piece of media, as we learned with Carl. But I do feel like they were both, like I said, extremely vulnerable about really difficult situations that are usually just handled within a family. So again, I'm gonna issue another content warning. If you don't wanna hear this, just skip ahead like 20 seconds. But Carl opened up about a he experienced as a child. After that experience, he wasn't able to unpack that and receive very necessary treatment after something so horrific happens to you as a child. He talked about how being in a position of power really exacerbated a lot of the issues that were planted in him at that really difficult time. Because it's one of those things, if you just brush something under the rug, eventually it's gonna come out undoubtedly, in one way or the other. So at Hillsong, there was a lot of pressure on him. And here he is, a survivor of abuse, also just a person <laughs> in the world who grew up in a very oppressive Christian environment and then remained in that environment. Shit is bound to go down in that situation. It's a pressure cooker. I think Carl did a good job of explaining like, okay, this isn't excusing my behavior, obviously, but it's an explanation as to why this sort of behavior festered and why it's also so prevalent in churches in general. At my mom's church that I mentioned, the pastor's son had an affair with the youth pastor's wife. Like I know that's horrible because it broke up two families because you know, obviously both married. It's a sad situation in some senses, but I just wanted to be like, yeah, of course that's gonna happen because you, there's so much pressure on these people to be perfect and to fit these molds and they get married super fucking young just so they can bang. And it's like, it just ignores the very essence of our humanness. I don't think that's what Jesus would want personally. Okay, so five years before Carl was fired, 2015, Leona Kimes was a nanny for them. So she had her own like family and kids and everything and her own nanny so that she could nanny for the lenses, which is like, okay, that's red flag number one. But anyway, she and Carl had an affair, but I will say Leona claims that she was taken advantage of by Carl, you know, somebody in a position of power. And Carl maintains that it was a consensual affair. I'm not really gonna comment much more on that because it's just such a personal matter and like, they're the only two people who know what really went down. So back to Carl's presence in the church. Like I said, he was a, he was very vocal about Black Lives Matter, but he really didn't do enough to push for more diversity and inclusion and was super vague about homosexuality, even though the church's stance was extremely clear. Basically, Carl was a cog in the machine, the religious machine of Hillsong, of the Christian movement, in general. While it was the 
reason for his come up. It was also the reason for his downfall. The documentary then takes a turn to go into the past of Hillsong. So they interviewed Jeff Bullock, who was a really influential figure in contemporary Christian music. So Jeff Bullock talks about how he and Brian Houston really were on the come up together with Hillsong as a church, like becoming a mega church basically. However, Jeff would see this other side of Brian Houston, who he called Angry Brian, that a lot of other people didn't see. There was a lot of pressure on him and he ended up leaving the church and he got ostracized. I mean, I'm saying it's like, it's like a cult, okay? He lost his friends, you know, his whole friend group. His wife left him. He lost his church family and Brian wouldn't even let the music directors sing any of Jeff Bullock's new songs. And then we go into episode three. In addition to the Vanity Fair journalists I mentioned earlier, other journalists who were prominent in this documentary and in the exposure of Hillsong were David Hardacre, David Fisher, and Lech Blaine. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing those right. So Brian Houston's family moved to Sydney in 1978. His father started a church that grew to large numbers and then Brian eventually became a pastor there and planted churches under that umbrella, one of which became Hillsong. Jeff Bullock actually came up with the name Hillsong, by the way. In 1989, Brian took a trip to the US and learned about prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel basically states that power and money are good and God blesses you with those riches if you are righteous. It's actually crazy because it's like, have you read the Bible? <laughs> the church became so much about money. Brian Houston became very flashy, you know, fake tans. He was chauffeured to church. He sat in a roped off area. He had bleached teeth, designer clothes, celebrities. It's interesting because I, it made me think of like how Scientology has a celebrity division in order to get celebrities to become Scientologists which fucking worked. <laughs> that being said, Hillsong was and still is about purity <coughs> culture. Oops. In fact, leadership made this woman stand up in front of the church with her partner at 19 years old and confess that she was pregnant out of wedlock. <gasps> that was super traumatic. And this is, you know, her first child. She's supposed to be joyful and this is unexpected blessing. That was pretty fucked up. So in 2014, there was a royal commission to inquire into institutional responses to instances and allegations of child abuse. I'm gonna issue another trigger warning. Skip the rest of the video if SA is, I'm not really sure what all I can say on YouTube, but if child abuse is something that um, is triggering for you, please skip the rest of the video. As it turns out, Frank Houston, who's Brian Houston's father, had been abusing children for 30 years, if not more than that. That's just what documentation they have. Because of this royal commission by Australia, one anonymous person who was called AHA spoke out about how Frank abused him for years he told his mom who became upset and said that if this becomes known then it's going to prevent people from coming to church so absolutely like disgusting mindset about this horrific act frank was protected by people of the church and the police commissioner was in his pocket frank was viewed almost as a god because he was a prolific church leader in New Zealand. Now remember I said they moved to Australia in the late 70s. Frank was a minister at the Salvation Army Boys Home in 1945, so Frank was in his early 20s, and there is a record of abuse committed by Frank at that time. Yet he continued to go on to open and run churches that eventually were attended by very prolific leaders in New Zealand and then later Australia. In November of 1998, these allegations caught up to Frank and he went on vacation and handed the keys over to Brian Houston, his son. So the Assemblies of God Church held an emergency meeting in 1999 about these allegations and to figure out what to do. And the church decided not to go to the police, which is obviously a criminal act in and of itself. You know, if you know of abuse and you don't report it, go to hell. So Frank Houston asked AHA, his victim, for forgiveness and offered him $10,000, 
Brian Houston was aware of this. In 2000, there were six accusers of Frank's abuse in New Zealand, yet there was a standing ovation by Hillsong Church for Frank because he was finally taking his departure. Frank's doctor, whose name is Dr. Gordon Lee, was a 22 year board member of Hillsong and he claims that Frank had dementia. And so he basically was not accountable in their eyes to these horrific acts that he committed. However, Frank was actually still preaching at different churches. In 2002, Brian Houston announced this abuse to the church and his opening line like seriously made me sick to my stomach. It was quote, my own father, who's my hero, was accused of sexual abuse, unquote. Absolutely disgusting, cowardly. You already know how I feel. I'm sure you feel the same way. Just disgusting, unacceptable. Frank died in 2004 without any convictions. Police were never contacted by Brian or the church who was very well aware of this abuse. Brian said, oh, I didn't know that was something I had to do. That being said, it was revealed that he actually sought legal counsel twice. Then we go back to Carl Lentz, who says that Hillsong always chose narrative over truth in terms of their cover-ups and how this was just like very common. So the Royal Commission of Australia releases this report, which shows that the church knew of the abuse for more than 15 years and did nothing about it and told nobody. The police commissioner, like I said, was entrenched in the church and even attended Frank's funeral in 2004. He did nothing with this information about Hillsong. And as it turns out, a lot of political leaders are Hillsong members. So even with this knowledge of the abuse in Hillsong, Brian Houston was invited to the White House to pray for Trump. And the prime minister of Australia was a member of Hillsong, which is crazy. And Brian Houston, like, prayed for him in the church. Like the prime minister was in the church and Brian Houston, you know, prayed over him. At this point in time, AHA, the anonymous victim and survivor, decided to go public. His name is Brett Sangstock and he's a fucking hero. He really is. He was experiencing life-threatening illness and he was terrified that justice would not be served in his lifetime. And that's why he decided to speak out publicly against this, including going to trial and reliving all of this awful abuse. Jeff Bullock claims that in the early 90s, Brian Houston told him of the abuse of Frank. However, Brian Houston claims he didn't know of the abuse before 1999, but I'm personally more inclined to believe Jeff Bullock. Finally, the police commissioner left in 2019. Then a real investigation of Brian Houston ensued, which is fucking crazy that that couldn't happen before. Brian Houston was finally indicted in 2021 for the cover up of this abuse. It's important to mention that Hillsong didn't respond to the documentary's multiple requests for comment. Then we enter the fourth and final episode of this documentary series. Hillsong posed these accusations as the enemy, which is very common in churches. Anything that's really against a narrative that they want, the church will pose it as like the devil. That's not even an exaggeration. <laughs> Brian Houston really couldn't escape this situation anymore because of the trial. So he left Hillsong in 2022 and his wife, Bobby, remained on, but then she was fired after a period of time. Carl Lentz said they all sign NDAs at Hillsong, which is crazy because all mega churches do this where they have people sign NDAs. So these churches have adopted corporate models, but one of the journalists said, in a corporation, you sign an NDA to protect trade secrets, but if you're not protecting trade secrets in a church, then why are you signing NDAs? You know, there was building resentment of the old boys club at Hillsong. This began at Hillsong College. They would interview new students and ask them, have you had sex in the last year? Have you masturbated in the last year? Have you watched porn in the last year? This is supposedly because they want you to be safe working with children. Ironic, isn't it? And if you don't pass this test, then they put a red dot on your tag, like a scarlet letter. <laughs> It's, it's like I'm laughing because it's insane behavior. One guy wasn't even able to go on tour as a drummer with the band because he quote, had a homosexual experience, unquote, as a child. Wrong. He was abused as a child. He was molested 
One person was, quote, struggling with homosexuality, unquote, and had to go to counseling, which is like conversion therapy light. Again, there are just so many examples of how harmful these cult-like practices are. Anna Crenshaw told her story to Vanity Fair. She was groped by a Hillsong staffer, Jason Mays. Hillsong tried to bury it, but thankfully she went to the police. He received two years probation and mandatory counseling. During this time, Hillsong promoted this motherfucker, Jason Mays. Oh, and guess what? Jason Mays' father is the head of human resources at Hillsong. Yeah, this goes deep. Then these stories start coming out about Brian Houston and how in 2020, this woman had an encounter with Brian in a hotel room. He was drunk and in this woman's hotel room for 40 minutes. And you'll never guess, but she got $25,000 of hush money from Brian and had her sign an NDA. Oh yeah, and then there was also somebody who got the same compensation, had to sign an NDA because Brian was sending her inappropriate texts. And after these stories came out, you'll never guess what Brian Houston did. He went on vacation, just like his father did, to escape the allegations against him. The church's bookkeeper, Natalie Moses, revealed that she saw an array of unethical accounting practices. When she tried to pursue internal methods of investigations, she was fired, yet no further investigation was completed. Documents revealed that the church's funds were used for personal luxuries and cash gifts given to board members some of whom helped the cover up of Frank's abuse. $10,000 went to each of the internal investigators of the hotel incident. So again, this is a pattern of institutional abuse. Hillsong earned $80 million Australian, more than was reported. Brian is still denying these charges. And even though Bobby, his wife, was fired from Hillsong and obviously Brian left, he is still trying to remain a preacher. Brian faces up to five years in jail for the cover-up of abuse, and his trial is recommencing this month, June of 2023. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully he's held accountable and gets all five years. Laura and Carl Lentz are still married, and it kind of leaves off on a positive note. Carl has a job in advertising, and... They admit that they're not perfect, but they are happy as a family and are working through things. Carl's in therapy. They live in Sarasota, Florida. And Carl actually went to rehab after everything went down that um, focused on pastoral burnout, depression, and anxiety. And also they were able to work through the abuse he experienced as a child. So they seem like they're in a really good place. Just to recap the like closing screen of the documentary. At its height, Hillsong was in 30 countries with over 150,000 congregants. As of March, 2023, only six out of 16 US locations remain. Hillsong NYC only has 500 attendees each week, which is down from like tens of thousands. And to date, there are 13 alleged victims and survivors of Frank Houston. The verdict for Brian Houston's trial is expected this month, June of 2023, with additional criminal charges regarding Hillsong's finances. Sources in the Australian government believe that Hillsong's charity status may be revoked and laws regulating tax exemptions for charities will be reviewed, which is also what we need to see in the United States. Now this documentary focused obviously on Hillsong, but I just wanna say that this type of shit, like I said, goes down in any big group of people. There need to be legitimate checks and balances. And if not, then shit is bound to go down. Church adds an extra level of spirituality and faith and the fear of literal damnation. I mean, it doesn't really get much worse than that when it comes to scaring someone. Abuse happens in these institutions, in churches all the time. Even if you are a Christian and you go to church and you love your church, just please remember and remind people that humans are humans. Jesus even said that, okay? They're not perfect. They will take advantage of power. Just because someone's an authority figure doesn't mean that they are right or more righteous, or beyond speculation in any way. Please be careful out there. Keep your friends and family informed of these things, and let's keep institutions accountable. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel. I'm so excited to make more of these. This weekend, I think I'm gonna watch the Shiny Happy People documentary, and maybe I'll make a video about that. So yeah, stay tuned. Give this video a like if you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.
Blessings and peace be with you.